I wanted to share something with you. I actually planned to go a whole different path, but um, last Saturday we gathered as women in the building and we had a speaker come and um, she shared a word with us and, you know, she said one sentence and it so got on the inside of me and started to generate some thoughts and some challenges and so I've spent the week just nutting that out and my heart is to share that with you this morning and it's out of Ruth 1 verse 8 to 22 and before all the men go oh it's such a girly scripture well I want you to clock on because it's it's at a point in the story where um, Naomi as a mum has lost her husband and lost her two sons and I don't know about you, but I just kind of put myself in that place. I have three sons and a husband, and I just think I can't let my brain go there. What that might be like to not only lose my owl, but with my one of two of my three boys would just be more than my heart could cope with. And so, when we read this story, it's not just a story. If you put yourself in the moment, it's devastation. She has hit rock bottom. She finds herself, not only has she lost a husband and she's lost two of her children, but she has two daughter-in-laws that culturally she's kind of it then. She's responsible for these girls and they would have made a commitment 10 years earlier approximately to lay down their life and follow this family as they did culturally back in that time and go wherever they went. And here they, the three girls find themselves in complete devastation. Both girls said no to Naomi when she really stressed and pleaded with them, go back, go back to your families, go back to your homeland, go back to your gods. And, you know, culturally, once you left over in those places, you left, you left for good. And having lived in India a little bit, I kind of really get a a vivid glimpse of that because that's culturally what they do to the girls. Once they pack up and marry they're gone. They don't necessarily connect as much with their family. And so I've kind of been thrashing this story out in my mind this week. How would I feel? What would I do? What would I do feeling responsible for these two girls? And I probably would do exactly what Naomi did. And she said, go back, go back to where you belong. I've got nothing for you. In this moment though, as the scene plays out, the two girls make two very different responses. Ruth in verse 16 says, Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge or or dwell, I will dwell. Your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. I thought that was amazing in the midst of horror. She's just determining in her heart, I'm going to stick to the course. The sentence or the, the, the line that got me last Saturday was this one out of verse 14. Orpah, not a funky name, Orpah. She kissed her mother-in-law and returned to her people and to her gods. So two women in exactly the same situation that lost the love of their life, lost direction, I'm assuming, lost whatever they thought was their plan and purpose, and yet two very different responses. So my question that I want to pose to us as a church community this morning is who do you relate to when the unforeseen happens, when that moment comes that blindsides you? Who do you relate to? Both women had a choice. Both women were experiencing the same grief, the same trauma, yet two very different responses. Do I keep going forward? Do I keep trusting God will make a way? God will work all things together for good. Ruth clung to Naomi. It was what she knew. She didn't have any other certainty, but all she knew is 10 years ago, I committed to your boy, I committed to your family, I'm just going to keep going. She had no idea what the future would look like, but she had made a commitment or a decision to go in a certain direction. Or do I return to what I know and what is familiar to me? Old thought patterns, lifestyles, friends, habits, Orpah had also made the same decision 10 years earlier. I'm married to your boy, committed to your family, I'm heading in a direction. But when it got tough, when it just went south in a major way and things had not gone the way she had hoped, she returned to her old way. She returned to her gods and to her family. Truth is, we're all clinging to something and it will continue to take us somewhere. What is it for you? Are you clinging to fear of what the future might hold? 
Are you f- clinging to lack, disappointment? I think disappointment, I've said to my girls in Break Free, is one of the greatest things that can shipwreck a believer's faith, is to stay in that place of disappointment when plans don't go the way we thought they would. Are you clinging to worry and stress? Or are you clinging to prayer? You know, on Mother's Day, I think of my own mother and while... You know, now as an adult and a mother myself, I have a greater appreciation for her. One of the the most amazing things I feel like she um, exemplified to me was she is a woman of prayer. Despite her challenges, despite whatever she feels about herself in her life, she is, is and has always been a woman of prayer and it is something that I will always be thankful to her for. So are you clinging to prayer when times get a bit funky? Do you go straight to the Word of God? Do you open up those pages believing that they are not just a story or a narrative, but there is something alive in there for me? Do you go to a place of faith? I don't know what's happening right now. I don't know, God, what you're doing, but I'm just going to press in and I'm going to believe that you are working all things together for good. And when he does come through, when he does speak, no matter how challenging or how difficult it is, do we have a heart to obey or do we want to shrink back? We have two choices when those moments hit. We can cling to what we know God has said, we can cling to what we know God has promised, or we can go back. We can turn back and go back to our old gods. Where do you run when the unforeseen occurs, when tragedy strikes, when di- or when disappointment comes knocking? Kirch and I were at home the other night and a friend of ours had sent us through a link of um, our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, preaching the Word of God. And I'm not here like to politicise anything, but I've got to tell you, I got so emotional at seeing this leader of our country opening up that Word of God. I didn't even care what he was speaking on. I just loved that he was speaking out of the Word of God. He shared this story, and of course, given his position... Um, in the work that he does, I kind of, we, we had a chuckle at home thinking, yeah, wow, it takes on a whole new meaning. But he shared out of Psalm 23, verse 5, and I want to share it with you this morning. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And we kind of laughed because we thought, i bet walking into some of those cabinet meetings feels like you are heading into the lion's den. But when I thought about it in my own world, what does it mean for God to prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies? Well, firstly, I thought, what are my enemies? What do I get up each morning and what are my enemies that I face? And I wrote a couple down, fear. Fear of what's going to happen today. Are my kids all good? Are my husband good? Have I prayed over them enough while they're on the roads? Do I worry? Disappointment, lack, sickness, all the same things that everybody else is confronted with. But yet scripture says to us that God has prepared a table for us in the presence, sorry, of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. I don't know whatever is being thrown at you right now, but I do know that God has prepared a table for you. It speaks to me of provision. It speaks to me that when we put our trust in him, verse 5 reminds us that he can and he will do everything to provide what we need when we need it. Sometimes our timing is not God's timing and I know it gets a little bit how you're going when you're sitting there waiting for God to come through. But I do know that my cup runs over suggests that God is providing for us. He has everything you need to not only survive, not only to drag yourself across the finish line and get through. So once you have walked through the now moment and say now moment, now moment, because now moments pass. That used to be my go-to when I was at uni. This too will pass, Jackie. This too will pass, and it does. You, yeah, well, that's another story. <laughs> when we get through the now moment, you will find his table. At his table, there is abundance, there is satisfaction, there is blessing, there is peace, there is grace, and there is an everlasting love for you. Nothing changes that. So how do we know what and how we are to walk it out? Four things I want to encourage you in. Prayer, nothing new, word of God, faith and obedience. When he calls on you or when that thing comes knocking that you just weren't expecting, get on your knees, open up the word of God, stir up faith in your heart and then trust that as I step out and obey, God is going to cause my cup to run over. 
you know, when I thought about it, I started to think of the New Testament and how there are awesome stories in there of how these lads who were just normal blokes doing exactly this. Peter on the boat, Luke 5, 5 says, Jesus had climbed into Simon's boat to teach the multitude. So they'd all gathered and in order to reach all of them and get his, I guess, his voice to project, he gets on the boat and says to Peter, let's head out a little bit so that I can share. When he finished sharing, he says to Simon, push out into deep water and let your nets out for a catch. Simon said, Master, we've been fishing hard all night and have not caught even a minnow. I don't even know what a minnow is, but I'm guessing it's like a dodgy fish that means nothing. Little fish. Here we go. It's a little fish. So they haven't even caught a little fish. But the key into that verse is, but if you say so, I'll let out the nets. But if you say so, I'll let out the nets. It was no sooner than done, a huge haul of fish straining the nets past capacity. What did it, what did it require of Simon? Obedience and faith. What is God asking of you right now? Acts 16, verse 16 to 20, we've got Paul and Silas. They were moved when they saw a little slave girl who was demon-possessed. And this little girl was being used by her master to fortune tell and bring him in revenue. So slavery at its best, abusing a little one. Compassion, of course, fell upon them and so they prayed for her. She was delivered. Consequently, they were both thrown in prison. Don't you love that? They both had stood up for their beliefs in a time when it was not popular and it was not the preferred religion. Sound familiar? Are we not living in those times today? But, don't you love when scripture says but or suddenly, but at midnight they prayed and they chose to worship God and suddenly there was a great earthquake. Can we picture that? Sitting in a prison cell and you'd be a bit filthy, like you're just basically going about the, the, the work of the Lord delivering the demon possessed. All of a sudden you find yourself behind bars, but they chose to worship and they chose to pray. The foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Prayer works, people. Acts 12, 15, sorry, 5 to 17, Peter's in prison. Herod decides that he's going to harass some from the church. So he kills James and he sees Peter and threw him into prison. Verse 5, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Who's the church? Just me today? Who's the church? Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Herod prepares to to bring Peter to the people for judgment. So he had a gnarly plan in place simply because Peter was going about the work of the gospel. Peter is sleeping, bound with not one but two chains. I find it interesting that one man caused them so much stress that they would bind him with two chains, put guards on either side or soldiers on either side of him, sorry, and then they had um, guards between him and the, the gate, the cell thing, whatever it is where they lock him up. Don't you find that weird that one person could cause such stress to them? But nonetheless, that is what they did. But the church constantly prayed. An angel of the Lord appears strikes Peter, raises him up and Peter's chains fall off and Peter walks out of the prison. How did that happen? How did that happen? Prayer. Does prayer work? My question is when I read those stories and I just think of things in my own world, is that the same God that I worship here on a Sunday morning? Is that the same God that you invite into your week? Is that the same God that you go to when you're challenged and facing things that you are not seeing within your life right now? Is that the same God that I'm encouraging you this morning to run to when things just don't work out well for you? You know, we are living, if I can talk corporately, we are living in times where there are still people that would like to harass the church. We've got people across Greater Sydney today who cannot worship 
like we can today because there are some people who would like to harass the church and you know how I know that because I sat there yesterday yesterday maybe Friday Friday I saw my roosters get slaughtered but the point is there was a sport gathered on a Friday night in Sydney there was no issue with that the church there are still people who are wanting to harass the church and the way they do it is a subtle there's a little outbreak and so we shut the whole body of Christ down in one area we stop them worshiping corporately we stop them praying corporately we stop them sitting under the word of God corporately well let me tell you the church prayed constantly and God loosed the shackles of one man that's the same God people that we're talking about this morning so who prepares a table for us who calls us to prayer who calls us to know his word who calls us to have faith and who calls us to a life of obedience there were two women who stood before their mother-in-law and had a choice to make both faced the same situation both um, I guess experienced the same devastation the loss of dreams the loss of purpose Ruth well she chose to stay she chose to plant herself commit and follow her mother-in-law and the result well there was blessing there was destiny her cup overflowed Orpah she opted to turn back it was too hard she was too devastated she was disappointed it wasn't fair she didn't see it coming and she returned to her own gods and her own ways the sad reality is when I looked through the scriptures you don't ever hear of Orpah again it's the only time even on Saturday night I thought who even is Orpah and it started to I've, I've not really read a lot about her but you literally don't hear about her again however Ruth she went on to prosper she stepped into the unknown she applied faith and obedience and God prepared a table for her where her cup overflowed just in closing I want to share a story about um, a sweet little friend that I've got um, in my workplace actually and uh, I was working with her recently and just catching up and talking about life and um, how things were going for her and she has been on a journey and she has spent a couple of years now uh, under medical care with a um, specialist and recently she's had a an appointment with that specialist and the specialist said to her um, there's nothing more I know to do she has a significant challenge with anxiety and stress and worry and it can be like a tsunami for her is how she would describe it and she's gone to this practitioner that she's seen for two and a half years and she's got to that place where the practitioner has said to her there's just literally nothing else that I can offer you and she suggested you go and you do what I've said for you to do but as for me I've got nothing new this is similar to Naomi she had said to the girls I just have got nothing else for you I don't know where it is that you need to go but I just know within me I've got nothing I guess the, the point of the story is if you rely on people or even yourselves there will always be limits we are full of limitations as humans even the greatest psychologists will get you to a point and I'm not anti them by the way in any way shape or form but my point is simply this it will come to a point where they are limited in how they can help you you go to a God who is limitless who created the earth who said let there be and it was there are no limits on him so when one door says I have got nothing left for you let me tell you there's another door that says you come to me and your cup will overflow what is God saying for you this morning what are you facing that perhaps you're tempted to go back to your old ways perhaps you're tempted to return to your homeland but perhaps there are enemies screaming out for you today what would God say for you this morning well let me tell you he would say to you come to me all who are weary I have the answers what he would say is as you pray open up my word it's not just a story it's not just a narrative that that is a book of miracles they are real life stories what he would say to you is if you would just provoke your faith if you would just cast your net out again if you would just trust me one more time what he would say to you is and then when I tell you to do the crazy 
step out, baby, and trust me because I'm about to perform a miracle. You're going to bring a harvest in. Let's pray. (coughs) Father, I marvel every morning at your faithfulness, God, to provide us with a day that reeks of opportunity. Lord, reeks of opportunity to see your faithfulness, to see your goodness, to see your grace. Lord, to see your incredible love for us. And Father, at the same time, every morning presents opportunity to be overcome with our situations, with the other voices, God, that would call for our attention. Father, I pray over every life in this building. Father, I pray over the little ones next door. Lord, that you would continue to work into us a need for prayer. Father, a a passion to pray. Father, for us not to be complacent in our daily devotion to you, God, to not replace it with busy. Father, to not replace it with just walks in nature, but to draw aside and to actually pray and seek heaven. Lord, I pray as we as a community opt to open up those pages, to open up, Father, that incredible story of the gospel. God, speak to us as a people, Lord. Open up the word of God to us, Lord. Let it be something that we would understand. And Father, I pray, stir up our faith. Lord, let us be a people. In these times, God, when we are challenged left, right and centre, Lord, when distressing situations are unfolding, God, in all areas of the world, Lord, I pray, let us be a people of faith. Let us, Father, be a people who would step out of the boat and opt to have a go at at least walking on the water. God, let us have the courage to cast our net again and give you another shot. And Lord, I pray that when the word of the Lord comes, that we would have the courage and the guts to obey. Father, I thank you. I thank you this morning for every person here. I thank you, God, for the journey that each one is on. I thank you, Father, for the stories that sit in this place this morning. Lord, I pray that you would meet every person at exactly the place that they're at. Lord, that you could would search the hearts of every person in this building. God, you know their comings and their going. God, you know beyond the smile. God, you know beyond um, the immediate circumstances. You look beyond the surface. And Lord, I pray that you would minister to your people in a way and in a language that they would understand. Let your grace, let your grace abound, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.